So welcome uh, to the uh, second uh, question and answer session that we are running on the Massive Open Online course, uh, Understanding uh, Economic Development from Poverty to Prosperity. And uh, we are here today with Professor Paul Collier again. Thanks a lot for your time uh, to, to do this. And last time we did it as a live session. This time we're going to do it um, as a, a recorded session that is uh, basically taking the questions from the learners that were posted over the week. Um, and we'll try to go through as many of them as possible. And thank you, Paul. And maybe you want to start with the... Uh, yeah, I, first, I just want to say, uh, look, it's, uh, it's great that you've done this course. I've met a lot of people who've done it. And, um, you know, it's an achievement to have, uh, to have thought your way through all that material. Um, uh, I hope you find it useful. The people I've talked to clearly have found it useful uh, and are finding it useful in what they're doing. So uh, let's keep going. Great. So we're going to start with the first question, which came in from Mohammed Haroun. And um, it is asking about the IMF. And um, in, in the question, it says IMF loans are not in favor of nation, but rather benefits elite and is a tool to get natural resources access. How do we avoid that? Um, and actually, when I read the question, it reminded me of what's going on in Jordan, uh, if, you, if you've been following, I'm sure, um, all the unrest, uh, which is in large uh, due to some structural reforms again that the IMF. Uh, and we did a lot of work in the Fragility Commission about the work of the IMF and how it can be uh, made better. So, Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the first thing is um, have a look at the, the report of the Commission uh, on state fragility. It's called Escaping the Fragility Trap. And one of the things we uh, hit on that is um, the changing, suggesting change relationships between uh, governments and the IMF, and for that matter, the World Bank. Um, and the essence of what we're recommending is that um, the IMF and the World Bank should um, provide governments with choices, with options, rather than, um, uh, as it were, coerce them into a, a single set of policies. Um, a second thing we're recommending is a degree of realism so that um, you recognize both the capacity constraints and the political constraints that the society is under, um, so that uh, you don't inadvertently increase fragility. Rafat, you saw an IMF program um, in Yemen that, uh, that helped, I'm afraid, to push the country over the edge back into conflict. And so um, there's a lot of scope for doing things better. Um, we launched the report um, at the IMF meetings um, in April. Um, and uh, uh, the IMF really took a lot of the stuff on board. They fortunately, they got their own internal evaluation of their work in fragile states that came out at the same time. And, uh, and their independent internal evaluation and ours were, were discussed together. Great, yeah, and um, if you just, this was the work of the LSE Oxford uh, Commission on State Fragility, Growth and Development. So um, I'm sure if you uh, search online for understanding uh, or escaping the fragility trap uh, and um, just type fr Fragility Commission, uh, you can look at that. And the other report that Paul just mentioned is from the Independent Evaluation Office of the IMF, and it's on the work of the IMF in the fragile state. So plenty of material out there to, um, to help in better understanding uh, the IMF process. Now, in the, in the second question from Ayman Grada, uh, is asking about liberal democracy, and is liberal democracy possible in a tribal society? And what do you think about authoritarian transition as a development strategy? Yeah, so um, again, the fragility report's really useful here. Um, and what we are suggesting there is that all states in their journey out of fragility into uh, an inclusive prosperity, uh, they need to do two things. Um, they need to develop checks and balances on the abuse of power 
um, and they need to develop uh, a positive capacity of government to, um, to, to get people to coordinate in the collective interest. Um, and those two things work together. Um, if we take the purposive actions of government that only government can do, um, let's take China. What was the big achievement in China? Um, they oversaw a generation which had a very high savings and investment rate. Something approaching half of all income was saved and invested for a whole generation. If you save and invest half of income, you grow. You grow out of poverty. Right? But the state had to actually channel that um, savings and investment into productive public investments such as, uh, such as cities. Um, very much the, one of the things the course stressed was the importance of, uh, of building uh, productive cities, cities that are productive and livable. And China's done that. Um, a remarkable achievement. Um, over, uh, over 250 million Chinese moved into cities. Um, and so that was a phenomenal urbanization. And the Chinese government succeeded in making these huge investments that make a city productive and livable yeah. because it had coordinated this very high savings effort. Now, you can only do a high savings and inve investment effort if every that everybody complies with if people trust you. Mm -hmm. And for trust, you need to build these checks and balances on the abuse of power. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you do that by elections or by some other means, that is, to my mind, a sort of second order issue. You've got to have the checks and balances on the abuse of power to build citizen trust. Mm. Um, and you've got to, you need that citizen trust in order to get purposive government that works for people. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, I think um, tribal societies are fine as long as people also develop a larger identity of belonging to, to the nation. And this is what um, President Nyerere achieved in Tanzania. Um, people in Tanzania still have a tribal identity, but they also have a strong national identity. And Nyerere very consciously built that. Uh, President Sukarno in Indonesia, exactly the same thing. Um, uh, building a sense of shared identity same instruments, common language, common efforts, common narratives. Um, Sukarno's achievement in Indonesia was even greater because it was over 3,000 inhabited islands yeah. that had to be brought together. Yeah, great. And I think in the process of answering that, you also answered the question specifically about China, um, which said that China has never been a democracy. Why should it ever become one? Um, and is democracy a mean or an end or just a Western imposition? I mean, I'll just add there that if, if China weakens in its efforts to build checks and balances on the abuse of power, then it'll be in trouble. Um, that's, the, that's, to my mind, the acid test. Does it win the trust of ordinary citizens? Yeah. And what was happening for a number of years in the last decade was that ordinary Chinese citizens started to feel sort of queasy about the Chinese government because corruption was rising. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's no accident that the, the new government has sort of made a big effort to try and crack down uh, on corruption in the elite. Yeah. Because if, once that becomes rampant and accepted, yeah. um, then autocracy absolutely can't work. And maybe in a follow-up question from Juan Villegas, um, the UAE is probably will not transit to a democracy in the near future, yet it developed a welfare state. How would you explain this case of a centralized state? So the, the UAE and a, you know, a few other of the, the countries in the, the Gulf or Brunei, um, they've got the luxury of huge uh, revenues from 
natural resource extraction. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they can amply afford uh, to provide a, a decent living standard for everybody. Yeah. Um, but um, I think, um, and we'll come to it in maybe a little bit later as well, that um, people in the end don't just live by consumption. Right. Uh, people are doers, not just passive consumers. Yeah. And one of the things they want to do is be involved in their, how their societies run. Um, and so um, the, uh, uh, the UAE can sort of get away with, um, with, with having just high levels of consumption um, whilst people can still have a memory of a period of very much lower consumption. Um, but I suspect that um, over time um, people will start to say, but we're not just passive consumers, right. we're, we're citizens. Yeah. And, and in the course we talked about um, <clears throat> the crossover point of $2,700 uh, above which and below which uh, transition to democracy can produce uh, different effects. And there's a question um, asking if, if you could provide more um, about the empirical evidence uh, of that study. Yeah, I mean, this was uh, work I did um, in, uh, I think it was published in 2008 in the Journal of the European Economic Association. And it was myself and one of my um, uh, young research people that I worked with. Um, and um, so you can go onto the website of the Journal of International Economic Association and look it up, 2008. But the, the data just, it was a simple relationship of, um, uh, we measured empirically for about 60 or 70 countries, what was the uh, incidence of various forms of protest, violent protests, strikes, that sort of thing. So we got a measure of, um, of, of protest in various forms, I think seven different types of protest and violent uprisings. Uh, so we looked at, so we created a, a probability of protest. Yeah. Um, and then we looked what was the relationship between per capita income and that probability amongst all the autocracies in the world. We got a relationship um, which was as, 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 uh, as income increased, uh, the danger of uh, protest in an autocracy increased. Yeah. What was the relationship in democracy? Um, uh, it went the other way. As income increased, the danger of protest decreased. Mm. And there was a crossover point. Um, and that happened to be about $2,700. How, how reliable is that? That was just descriptive features of, of the data. Yeah. It doesn't mean that um, any country at that stage is, is literally on the cusp. It was just a, uh, a feature that described those two relationships and had this implication. Yeah. And, um there's uh, in the additional uh, reading resources section of the module that speaks about that. You can find the uh, journal that uh, Paul just mentioned, and you have an amazing memory to remember all these uh, <laughs> research pieces you did and when. <laughs> I wouldn't have remembered. Um, but in another question, which is slightly uh, moving beyond um, this uh, transition to democracy, is how important do you think social media is in the creation of narratives and identities? Um, and, um, you know, the idea of influencers and their virtual communities and, and social media. Yeah. I think this is really important um, and it's, it's got the potential to be good and it's also got the potential to be very dangerous. Yeah. Um, uh, the, um, uh, obviously the dangers are that um, the people who are sort of nodal in a network, uh, the key communicators, yeah. um, can use that power of communication for their own agenda. Right. And then it depends whether that's a good or a bad thing, depends on what their agenda is. Yeah. You know? um, and uh, you know, in a lot of, lot of the world, if it's popular, it's either populist uh, or ideological. Um, both of these are dangerous. Um, 
I'm a pragmatist, right? Um, I believe in trying to learn from evidence what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. Um, ideologies just said, I know it all from first principles. Um, uh, I don't need to look at the evidence. Yeah. And uh, uh, populists say, I know it all from my heart. I don't need to look at the evidence yeah. and I don't need to use my brain. Yeah. Right? Um, so both of these are, can be very dangerous. We've seen it at work in the uh, high income societies where what's happened is that the intermediating skills of journalism, a profession which had some standards, those have been cut out yeah. um, by social media. So most people under the age of 35 in the uh, rich world get their, most of their news just directly from listening to other people in social media. Yeah. That's very dangerous. Um, because uh, that's the, the way fake news is generated. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I was uh, just in MIT uh, yesterday, and they had a very interesting work being done on mapping what the conversations on Twitter and, and showing the difference between different clusters and how spread they are and what they believe in. And, 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 and it was very clear they were doing something on the uh, US elections and how the different Trump supporters versus Hillary supporters compare. So we might share the link to that study uh, later, either in the video or in the mm -hmm. course. Um, there's another question about the uh, difference between English speech in African countries, um, which the question says are relatively more developed than their French counterpart. Uh, and what do you think accounts for this? First of all, is that uh, accurate um, depiction? Um, I think um, uh, now there's some truth in it. If you went back 25 years, if you looked in 1990, yeah. um, the, the Francophone societies looked quite a bit more successful than the Anglophone. And I think, um, I think the difference is that the, the French government stayed much more closely involved um, um, so there was a, for quite a long time, there was a sort of semi-colonial phase okay. in Francophone Africa. And, um, and so when the French finally sort of let go, um, a decisive moment was where they allowed the coup to take place in Côte d'Ivoire. Okay. Um, um, so when the French finally let go, then, um, you go through a learning process in Francophone African societies, analogous to the learning process that uh, Anglophone African societies had gone through in the 1960s and 70s. Right. Um, and, um, and by the 1990s, Anglophone societies were really coming out of that learning phrase, phase and uh, starting to be successful. And, uh, and now we see um, you know, sort of the fruits of that success. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, you, can, you can make too much of that. I mean, I was in uh, Senegal um, in October. I was in Mauritania last month. And um, both of these are Francophone societies, um, but they're, they're, they're sort of pretty smart societies that are now managing rather well, I think. And maybe that's an answer to the next one, which is uh, what do you consider to be the most successful state in tackling both economic and social issues following a post-colonial state of anarchy? Well, um, undoubtedly the most successful state in the world uh, following uh, de decolonization is, is Singapore. And it's so successful that we forget that actually in the early years of independence, uh, it was quite a mess. Mm. Um, uh, when uh, Lee Kuan Yew became prime minister in the early 1960s, um, which was after initial phase of independence, right. he inherited a real mess. Right. The, the society had just been thrown out of the federation with Malaysia. Right. It wasn't welcome yeah. and it was polarized ideologically and, uh, and divided uh, also by ethnicity. And so it was a deeply uh, riven and fragile society. Um, 
uh, now it's united and hugely prosperous. So that's globally, that's the most dramatic pullback. Um, if we look more recently, I think Rwanda. Um, if you go back to 1994, you coming out of genocide, um, the uh, previous government has just disappeared. You've got a, a, a small group that's, uh, that's come in. Um, this is uh, a society which is deeply landlocked, has no natural resources, um, is overpopulated, so very short of land. This is the situation from hell, uh, Rwanda, in 1994. Yeah. Um, it's grown very, very strongly since then with an inclusive growth um, and uh, it's a remarkable story of, uh, of purposive government that has worked for uh, the broad mass of the population. So um, that certainly, um, was, was Rwanda in anarchy in 1994? No, it was, but it was a very, very ugly and difficult situation. Those are good examples and probably one of the um, distinctions between the ones that made it and the ones that didn't are the kinds of narratives that are told in, in society. And the next question from Ulia is, why do religious and ethnic narratives seem to be more successful in influencing the masses rather than their economic interests? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, um, and I think I've got a really good answer, which is that um, people are not just focusing on their own consumption. Right. They want to belong. Yeah. They need a sense of, of identity with a group. And that is a fundamental human drive, just as the drive for consumption. The idea that we're all greedy, rational, economic man and nothing else is complete rubbish. Right? Um, because for many, many thousands of years, early man had to survive in very harsh environments where the only way to survive was be in a group. Yeah. Uh, and so rational economic man was just too selfish um, to survive. He was pushed out of the group. <laughs> <laughs> rational economic man died out um, in favor of rational social man. Yeah. Um, and rational social man wanted to belong. He wanted the esteem of the group. And that tempered his selfishness um, in favor of the, the actions necessary to be accepted as belonging and to get the esteem of the group. Um, why are um, religious and ethnic narratives um, more successful than economic self-interest? Because they offer ready means of belonging. Now, can we do better? Of course we can, because um, both ethnic and religious identities usually divide societies. Right. So you belong to one group, but you're oppositional to some other group. And that's very, very damaging. And so there's a much better way of doing a shared identity, which is a shared sense of purpose and a shared sense of place. We all live in this country. That's where we belong. And what is our shared sense of purpose? We've all got an opportunity by working together as Lee Kuan Yew managed to tell people in Singapore, yeah. if we all hang together, um, we won't hang separately. We'll become prosperous. Mm. And that message combines a sense of enlightened self-interest. It's in your, eventually it's in your economic interest, um, but it combines that with offering a powerful sense of identity, yeah. of shared belonging. That's the importance of narratives. And um, in another question from Achiri Fry, what is the way forward for a state where protests against the government is not allowed, like in most African countries, and how can such a state become inclusive? Yeah, um, there are often pivotal moments when um, repressive governments uh, change their leadership and that gives the new leadership an opportunity to um, behave differently. Um, we've got exactly that moment in Zimbabwe at the moment. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, 
uh, Mugabe was, in my opinion, an awful leader who um, divided the society very badly and delivered uh, mass poverty. Mm. Um, uh, the change of government gives the new leadership an opportunity to demonstrate that it's, it's inclusive, right? that it actually is going to work for all Zimbabweans. Mm. And um, it's very much in its own interest that it does that, because only if it signals inclusion and a common sense of purpose for mutual benefit, only then will citizens trust the government enough to comply with what it wants them to do. And the typical uh, repressive state tries to manage by coercion, yeah. and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The coercion is so costly that all the government manages to do is stay in power, but it's in, a, in an impoverished society. Yeah. And eventually, almost everybody loses from that. Mm. And so, eventually, those pivotal moments happen, and, um, and that's an opportunity when you say, um, now, we are willing to be reconciled with this, with the, this new government, yeah. but the government has to signal convincingly to us that you're going to operate in the interests of everybody. Yeah. The moment, for example, in Venezuela, you've got a government which very much isn't doing that, yeah. and we're not quite at a pivotal moment. The pivotal moment will arise uh, in Venezuela um, when um, the forces within uh, that uh, repressive and authoritarian state start to break up um, because the society at an economic level is failing so disastrously and at a social level it's failing so disastrously. There are thousands and thousands of people fleeing as refugees. This in a society that should be one of the richest societies on earth. And so at some stage the forces that are being used for repression will start to question, can we in any sense justify what we're doing? Yeah. And when coercion fails, um, conflict arises. And there's another question that brings us back a little bit to um, the fragile and conflict affected states, we could say. Um, and it's a question about, we talked in the course about scale and specialization and how societies need that. And the question is, um, to what extent do you think specialization could help an economy which is in conflict or under civil war, such as the case of South Sudan. So maybe we can talk a little bit about what role uh, the private sector and, yeah, um, yeah. can play in, in conflict. So um, in, a, in all these poor and conflict-ridden societies, um, you, I, th I think two things need to happen. One is you need to get to some sort of peace through power sharing. Um, where you've got conflict in a divided society, you know, South Sudan, um, at the minimum it's a division between the Dinka and the Nuer, but it's actually much more uh, fragmented oppositional groups than that. Um, but it's clear that any way forward in South Sudan involves the Dinka and the Nuer generally, genuinely sharing power. Mm. There is, there's, there's, without that, um, uh, both groups will lose massively, as they are losing now. Yeah. Um, and so first you get to, to power sharing, and then, uh, having re-established peace, the route out of fragility is predominantly um, the economy needs to grow so that it delivers um, rising living standards for everybody and growing the economy really means bringing in firms that can harness that scale and specialization. Right. Now, firms um, are not, um, you know, they're, they're not trying to serve the fragile state, they're, they're necessarily um, trying to be financially viable. Mm. The firms that are not financially viable 
well, disappear. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and the first firms to go to a sector in a fragile state um, will probably lose money. It's known as first mover disadvantage. And so it's very good use of international public money aid to try and uh, compensate uh, those firms that are the pioneers in a sector um, to, to go and, and open up that sector. I mean, to give you one example, um, in 1980, a garments firm, an international garments firm, went to Bangladesh. It was the first garments firm in Bangladesh. And uh, it, only, it only survived for three years. It lost so much money that after three years they gave up. Yeah. But during that three years, enough Bangladeshi workers worked in that firm that the Bangladeshis who worked in the firm said, the management of this firm, this foreign firm, doesn't know how to operate in Bangladesh, but we do. And so they learned how to make garments, how to sell them. Um, and then once the foreign firm left, many, many Bangladeshi firms set up in the garment sector. Mm. Now it's a $30 billion uh, annual export sector. It's huge. It's provided thousand upon thousand of jobs, a lot of them for young Bangladeshi women, which has improved the position, the bargaining position of women in Bangladeshi society. And so it's been enormously beneficial. Yeah. But what started it was one firm that went in there and lost money. We can't count on having firms that go in and lose money. Yeah. Um, so it's a good use of public money to, to pump prime, to mm. get those firms in. Absolutely. And um, there's a question that, um, that tries to uh, maybe learn lessons uh, from Switzerland's experience. And the question is, um, what's your thoughts on Switzerland's ability to maintain independence in the cantons um, while supporting a thriving economy, although it's a landlocked uh, country? Yeah, so Switzerland's got a lot of things right. Um, one thing is uh, it's, uh, it's three language groups. Right. German, French, Italian. Right. Um, if you look historically, have the Germans and the French always got on with each other? No, they fought three murderous wars in 70 years, right? But not within Switzerland. And so in Switzerland, the Germans and French learnt to live together. Right. Um, uh, and the same with the, with the Italians. Now, the way they did it, um, um, was, yes, they say they're all Swiss, but they also recognize that with these three different language groups, there are going to be three different identities alongside the shared overall identity. Yeah. And so, um, and the Germans are in a majority. And so you can't just have, um, you know, national elections and say, oh, the Germans won again. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's a system which, for example, in the civil service, every job in the civil service is assigned, uh, this is for a German speaker, this is for an Italian speaker, this is for a French speaker. And so the division of jobs in the civil service is, is according to the split of the population between the language groups, yeah. which means that the majority can't abuse its power to capture everything. Yeah. Um, Secondly, you've got a lot of decentralization to the canton. And so um, a lot of local level autonomous um, power of, of decision and public policy. Right. And uh, both of these ideas, the, the carve up of jobs in the civil service by language groups, the decentralization of decision to individual cantons, which are then either Italian speaking, French speaking or German speaking. These are very good ideas for, um, for, for maintaining cohesion in a society that could otherwise have dissolved into conflict. Um, we'll take maybe a couple more questions. And one is about back to uh, norms. And it's from Helen Osborne. And what is it about the nature of a norm or what factors drive generational attitude uh, change 
that can lead to a positive shift in societal norms. And you mentioned the example of dwelling uh, in, uh, in the course and kind of what, what makes a norm so impactful in a society. Yeah, so um, I, th I think of um, uh, uh, good outcomes in a society as a result of um, uh, building a sense of, uh, of shared identity across everybody in the society. That's compatible with more localized or differentiated identities, but you need to build a sense of the big we. Yeah. We all belong together. Yeah. Um, then um, you build a purposive narrative that says, if we all do this, then we'll all be better off. Yeah. Yeah? That gives a, a sense of purpose to, uh, to what people should be doing collectively. Yeah. And then, f then with those two things, you build the norm. Um, uh, I ought to do this because you're going to do it. Yeah. And, um, and if you do it and help me, I ought to do it and help you. And that's the, the, the norm of, of reciprocal obligation. And that, that sense of, I have responsibilities to you because you have responsibilities to me. Um, this was the, the great insight of, of Adam Smith, that you could exchange obligations right. just as you can exchange goods. Yeah. And in The Wealth of Nations, he uh, had the insight that the exchange of goods in trade was mutually beneficial. Right. In The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which was his other book, which he thought was more important, um, he had the insight that the exchange of obligations, I'll do this for you if you do this for me, right. that that is also hugely beneficial for society. Yeah. That exchange of obligations depends upon the actions being purposive. Yeah. If we both do this, we'll both be better off. Yeah. And that we can trust each other because we're part of some common community. Yeah. We are a we. Yeah. And how does that translate when it comes to um, supranational, let's say, entities like the EU? There's another question from Monica uh, that asks about the EU. It has a reputation of being economically successful, but politi politically standing on clay legs. What is missing to build a common European identity? Yeah. Um, what's missing to build a common European identity is a common European <laughs> identity. Um, it's, it's um, I was just uh, yesterday in a meeting of... Um, I was addressing 110 um, youth leaders from across, across Europe. Yeah. Um, so that, that issue came, came up very strongly. Um, and I think the, um, the British in no position to talk very sensibly about Europe, yeah. but um, I think what was missing was a, first of all, a proper sense of, of common purpose. If we all do this, um, we're all better off. Um, and um, and Europe became too sort of centralized, technocratic, um, uh, 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 an elite in Brussels with a separate, with its own identity, right. rather than um, uh, building narratives which said um, Europe is for ordinary people, and uh, it's there to solve the problems that ordinary people face. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so it, um, it became um, an, a, a normative agenda too much dictated by um, powerful elites and not sufficiently a normative agenda generated by um, ordinary people. I'm very keen on um, the cooperative movement across Europe. And the cooperative movement is ordinary people exchanging obligations mm. to address the genuine problems that ordinary people face. Yeah. Um, and so a Europe of, uh, of, of collaboration between cooperative societies yeah. would look very different from a Europe um, uh, directed um, by a, a technocratic elite based in Brussels, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll conclude by a question that um, we're now doing a lot of work at the Blavatnik School of Government as well on, 
um, in a project that we launched that looks at um, technology and inclusive development and how technology is changing uh, Pathways for Prosperity, which is the name of the new project here at the Blavatnik School. Um, and it's a question we've been kind of uh, trying to address, uh, which says, you know, traditionally the, the pathway has been to move from agriculture to manufacturing, that's how you lift the masses, and um, for that, the competitive advantage was the cheap labor that countries had. And with this increasing uh, momentum towards um, robotics and automation and fully automated factories, uh, we were at a session that uh, one of the speakers mentioned for the first time in 20 years that Adidas is opening a factory in Germany, uh, or did open it last mm -hmm. year. Uh, and so we, we have this reshoring movement that has uh, been called, and least developed countries are, are now faced with a situation where they might not have the option mm -hmm. to move towards that. And maybe you can tie that as well to, um, you mentioned Adam Smith, and I know you're writing a book on capitalism as mm -hmm. well. Um, but I mean, w the essence, I guess, of, of Adam Smith's argument for capitalism is that the more the capitalist had, the more people he employed, and everyone got better together. And if in today's society the more capitalists uh, are better off, they're having more robots, society is not getting that. How do we address this uh, shift? Yeah. So uh, I've indeed got a book coming out in October called The Future of Capitalism yeah. Facing the New Anxieties. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what the book does. It faces the new anxieties. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is an opportunity to advertise that. Yeah. Um, but um, the, the problem you refer to is a, a real problem that sometime over the next 20 years, a lot of these um, uh, low-skilled manufacturing jobs will, will, will disappear. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that um, uh, that poor people um, won't have opportunities for productivity, but it does mean that um, the, the type of firm that comes, um, the uh, skills that uh, ordinary people will need will change. And so the, the manual skills are going to go down in value. Um, the service skills require people to use their heads as well as their hands. Right. Um, and that shows, that emphasizes the importance of raising the quality of education yeah. in poor countries. I right. think that's, uh, that's, that's going to be one major lesson. Yeah. Um, uh, the other is um, uh, where will acti economic activity happen? Increasingly in cities, and that takes us back to the the urban agenda that I gave. So um, the two surefire things you need to be able to, uh, to prosper in 20 years time will be uh, functioning cities and an educated workforce. Right. That's the best we can say, I think. With that, I think we will conclude uh, this uh, question and answer uh, session. Thanks a lot, uh, Paul, for a f fascinating journey through topics as wide as they can, <laughs> yeah. they can come. And um, good luck to all the uh, students, but maybe you um, want to give a final message? Yeah, I do. Uh, I admire you um, for, for the struggle and the effort you've shown uh, to, to fight your way through this course and learn and master it and then use it. Um, we've had thousands of people who've done that um, and, uh, and now you've joined that, uh, that group. Um, you are a group. Um, you'll meet other people, many other people who've done this course. Please encourage others to join that group um, and together you can make a difference to the world. Thank you.